Thank you for joining this uh, talk. The first part of the talk is, will be given by me, and the second part will be given by Jesus. William Lowell Putnam was a banker, and his wife established the fund in 1927, and first competition was given in 1935. The Putnam competition is given on the first Saturday in December, and for the morning three hours, we have six problems. They are labeled by the letter A, and then we have a two hours of lunch break, and another six problems are for the afternoon session. They're labeled by B, and we receive these um, exams electronically, and then I print it out, the supervisor print it out, and the students take the test at their home institutions. This is a direct co quote from their website. 12 problems can be typically be solved with only basic knowledge of college mathematics, but require extensive creative thinking. Here, the basic knowledge of college mathematics could be calculus sequence, linear algebra, and differential equations, number theory, abstract algebra, and those things. But there are, you know, good, you know, two or three problems one can solve with this basic high school algebra with uh, you know some logical power and you can uh, still solve one of the, some of those problems even for those problem that has um, college material required and it usually doesn't require some fancy theorem and I think those committee uh, members a test committee actually, make that assessment and try to do extensive research such that, you know, you can't just solve this type of problem because you know so-and-so theorem. So as far as I know, they are pretty good at that. This is about grading. The maximum points one can get is a 10 points, and nearly all the problem is about proving. So um, justifying all the assertion is very important, and one gets partial credit only when the progress is substantial. And from my experience, this is a pretty accurate description about grading. So I sampled some of the questions. Um, A1, that means this first uh, question that you can look at in the morning session. So it is about determining the values of A and B such that this line intersects this fixed uh, um, log curve and exactly one point. So exactly one point it's probably the tendency. So after you read this problem, you immediately know this is one of the problems you may see in the calculus exercise section. So um, you don't see this type, uh, a lot of these problems in the Putnam. So I was surprised. It was relatively straightforward. Problem was there. Of course, I tried, but um, I'm not going to say anything more than that. And the uh, second problem I prepared here is A3, is a third problem. And Jesus is going to say something about this problem. So P is a prime number. FP denotes the number of infinite sequences. So think about um, infinite sequence of even numbers. It has infinitely many terms in there. Here, the number of infinite sequences is not talking about number of terms. Even sequences, 2, 4, 6, and 8, that infinite sequence is just a one sequence. So um, they are counting number of infinite sequences. An has to be in this finite choice and must satisfy this congruence relation. Prove that the number is congruent to 0 or 2 mod 5. So that's a third problem. Here's A4. So also, Jesus is going to talk about this problem. And x1, x2 are random real numbers chosen in between 0 and 1 independently. So these are typical random variable but there are infinitely many of them. You pick, uh, you're picking these uh, numbers. As soon as you arrive, the xk plus 1 is larger than xk. You stop and calculate this summation over here. I'm pointing there. But if um, xk plus 1 is always smaller than the other one, and you have to do this infinite sum. So for chosen this infinite sequence of number between 0 and 1, you can calculate this value s according to that description. But if you keep repeating this over and over, what is the expected value of s? And that is um, what the question is asking. Jesus is also going to talk about this problem. 
So we're switching to the afternoon session in B2. I selected this problem. So another familiar context um, that I, I think it is. So I chose that. Here's a um, cross symbol. is a cross product. So if you look at the set, which is uh, close under this cross product, um, how many um, is that for which integer n um, is this set possible? So we know cross products and is all have taking place in R3. You can visualize and all that. So when I read this problem, I immediately jumped in. Uh, this is my kind of problem. I want to do that. Things like that. So, um, well, for example, if this uh, the V and W can be repeated. So V cross V is allowed in here. So that's a zero vector. If you cross itself, you get the zero vector. So S must have a zero vector. And if you have a non-zero vector V, that's uh, two elements, so it's got to be at least two elements. So I tried that. I thought it's really fun. You can try that as well. So I chose a sixth problem of the afternoon session just to feel that how difficult can that be. So here it is. All find all continuous functions from positive real numbers to positive real numbers that satisfy this type of thing. It's just typical functional equation question. But it is not differentiable, not necessarily, not necessarily integrable. Um, you know, if this continuous function is a Riemann integrable at least, but we do not have much of these um, differential techniques available. So that was the sixth problem of afternoon session. So this year is a committee. The main committee is this Brian Hunt and Richard Stong, that's a chair, and Carl Malberg. These are the three committee members. And for the past three or five years or so, uh, they were having these additional problem contributors. Contributors, Gabriel Carroll, that has been many times in the contributor, um, contributing members, and Richard Stanley and Michael Larson were um, contributing problem contributor for this this year. So let me go over some of the statistics of um, the past competition. 3,415 participants were there from 456 institutions across the United States and the Canada. And nearly 40% um, of the students scored zero out of those 12 problems. And nearly a little over 28% scored uh, one question, I got one question perfectly correct, I think. And they have additional data about uh, top 16%. So I wrote down the, the scores of these top 16%. That they scored at least 19 points. And only 57 students scored more than 60 points, which is 1.6%. The top five um, scorers are called Putnam Fellows, and they received an award of $2,500. And as far as I know, that amount never changed. For a long time, it never changed. I think they had to change that one, have to bump up that um, amount a little bit. And Elizabeth Lowell Putnam Prize was awarded to Binway Yan. It happened that all these six people uh, from the one department, an MIT mathematics department. So I was able to get to the photos of all the six people easily from the school website. So let me go over this um, statistic of the top 16% for, uh, for those uh, problem that I just reviewed. A1 was that intersection problem with the tangency. 26 of them, 26% uh, got the perfect 10 points, and 14 people tried and received the zero points, and 13 people didn't even attempt that A1 problem. So I was surprised that 13% that is a little high for me for how this A1 um, sounded like. A3 is going to be presented by Jesus, and 37% scored uh, full 10 points, and 43% didn't even did not attempt that problem. A4 was this random variable problem, and I felt that that was difficult, the problem there. And only 5% of the students 
got the full 10 points, but there are lots of nine, uh, nine point scorer there. Not many people got nine points, so I included that statistics, 19% of them, and 46% people didn't attempt that problem. B2 was this cross product problem, and I thought this is really accessible. I was surprised that only 20% of the people got uh, only 10, 10 points and 16% didn't attempt that problem. So B6 was this toughest problem in the afternoon session. And it turns out only one student got the full credit and 21 students scored zero. And most of the students, 77%, didn't attempt the problem. So let me talk about the Putnam Seminar. Um, it's a one credit hour course, and we meet, uh, we have a 50 minute um, meeting session every week. We discuss the various problem sets from, from old sets from, from uh, different sources. And it's, uh, my, when I'm doing it, I require a student to uh, attend all these uh, 50 minute meeting session and participate in the competition. And usually offer the presentation opportunity in the Spring Hudson Colloquium um, event. This is a list of a faculty um, who are in, on Armstrong campus and doing this Putnam supervision starting at the 1970, and I was the last person who was doing it. And since I'm at um, on a Statesboro campus, that was I'm no longer doing that. And so we are uh, haven't found another faculty who would like to continue this Putnam seminar. So please let uh, Stephen know that if you're interested in doing this Putnam seminar. Um, so that we can continue this wonderful tradition. On the Statesboro campus, Goran Lasaja started at the 2002, and the past couple of years, Said and Goran um, were co-running this Putnam seminar. So if you're interested in solving a tough math problem, please join the seminar and, um, you know, go ahead and knock out some problems. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Um, so as Dr. Chang mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, problem A3 and A4. Uh, those were, I think, the two problems that I try the most in the exam. Uh, I only got A3, but there are cool ideas in, in this probability problem that I wanted to share. And so, since the you know the the sort of I, the philosophy between the Putnam is. Uh, we have complex problems that can be solved uh, using simple ideas, just in creative ways. So um, my plan is to go over sort of these basic ideas, build them uh, as from as scratch as I can. Um, but I, I'll try to go quickly over them, and then we're just gonna uh, go over uh, the ideas needed for these two problems, right? Um, so we're gonna begin with uh, problem A3, which was a number theory, and, and Oh, ask sort of philosophical question. What does it mean uh, for? I'm gonna move this. Wait, how do you move it? What does it mean for two things to be equal? Right. Uh, we usually talk uh, two equals one plus one or these Taylor series. Um, but the truth is, uh, those those two equalities, while related, do not are not speaking of the same thing. Right. One is talking about uh, equality between two numbers and the other one between two functions. And so uh, there's something deeper going on. And, and the answer that I have for that question is two things are equal if, if they represent the same thing, right? And, and that varies according to the context. But the, but the, the thing is sometimes we, we want to look at two contexts at the same time. Um, and so it's, it's important to sort of keep to like know how to differentiate between both contexts, right? And so uh, we have uh, here uh, congruences, and, and that is every number has a unique residue when you when you divide it by a number that whatever you choose. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, sort of two numbers are gonna be congruent, and that's gonna be our alternative type of equality if if they represent the same residue, right? Uh, and the cool thing about congruences is that they work very similar 
to the usual sense of equality between numbers that we that we talk about. Uh, and in particular, it works perfectly with addition and multiplication, right? And here I, I'm just showing the the addition process, but essentially uh, the sum of the residues is uh, the residue of the sum, right? And and you have to be careful when defining these things, but but, but that's a nice property that that congruences have and. and uh, Gonna come in handy a little bit uh, later. Um, now, when when the modulus and the modulus is the number uh, by which you divide, when the modulus is, is a prime, um, you gain another two interesting properties, right? And so here I'm showing uh, some congruences modulo six. So for example, eight and two are congruent modulo six because they leave the same residue, but we can't divide. Uh, or, I mean, if we if we sort of divide in the usual sense of the word, um, we're going to arrive to something that's not true, right? Um, and also, two times three is six, and six leaves a residue of zero modulo six. Um, and I'm just showing that. And so, when 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 you have a prime, it turns out that that the congruence does resemble more uh, equality in that division does work, and this property that we often use in in you know, algebra or, or calculus, when you have a product equal to zero, then you know that one of, of, the, of those factors has to be zero, right? Um, and to divide, uh, to divide, uh, I, I like to think, well, dividing is sort of multiplying by this inverse multiplicator, right? One over A. Uh, the, the, the th and, but what, but sort of the, the, the key detail is that the multiplication of those two equals one, right? And so, um, when you have a prime number and you take uh, sort of this residue system, there is all, for all the non-zero numbers, there is always an inverse, right? Which we denote by a to the negative one. Um, and and th this set with this operations of addition and multiplication and this equality as being understood as the congruence modulo p, uh, it forms what, what we call a field, right? Um, and it's going to come in handy later to just sort of avoid uh, additional notational work. Um, but but we're, so yeah, we're going to use it. And uh, here in the title, I, I wrote FP plus. That's just going to mean um, sort of the positive residues, right? So without zero. Um, although a, a little bit of a notation abuse, uh, P leaves a residue of zero when divided by P, right? So uh, p minus one, we often also write as just negative one. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about probability. Um, you know, if you have a list of numbers and each one is equally likely to come out, um, the expected value, which is just a fancy name for average, uh, is just the usual arithmetic mean that, that we that we know, right? But sometimes uh, some of these numbers are more likely to come than others. Um, and so to, to account for that, we, we assign to each one a weight. Um, and, and so that the weights add up to one because the probability of getting a number is gonna be one. Um, and you can notice that you know, the top formula is just a special case, right? Uh, where all probabilities are the same. Um, and a little bit further in that direction, uh, as you as you move from discrete uh, sort of finite or countable lists to a more continuous setting, uh, this sum becomes an integral, right? And uh, where the sort of row of x uh, is the analogous of the weight, uh, uh, and it's not exactly the probability that x is going to come out, but uh, sort of the limit of this summation process, right? So expected values have two uh, interesting properties, which are gonna be used in the solutions. The first one is uh, that uh, the sum of the expected values is the expected value of the sum of these random variables. And if, uh, if the value of a random variable y um, sort of can be expressed I, I, I write the pants, but it's more like if you can um, sort of understand it easy, easier in terms of another random variable x, right? Um, 
and 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 this is what what this is this uh, at the bottom what this refers is if you have different cases of x and in each of them uh, your random variable y is going to behave differently, right? You can look at the expected value in each case and then get the expected value of those expected values, and and it's going to be the same as if you had gotten the expected value. Um, so those that that was like the basic theory. And and now I'm gonna sort of talk about this problem A3, which was the problem I was able to solve during the exam. Uh, so let's just read over it again. You have a prime number that's greater than five. Uh, you're counting the number of sequences such that they belong to this set, which we called earlier F plus F FP plus, uh, and such that they, they satisfy this uh, congruence equation, right? Uh, and we have to prove that this number of, of sequences is uh, leaves a residue of zero or two when divided by five. So um, I'm just sort of restating the problem using using uh, a little bit of the notation that we that we introduced earlier. Um, and the first the first two things that come out um, is we, we want to count the number of sequences, right? And, and, and we're giving the condition that they have to satisfy in order for us to like care about them. Um, so I guess kind of an instinct reaction is, is, is to see if there's a way to explicitly um, tell what this number is, right? Sometimes it's not possible and you have to show your identity by other means, but, but it's always worth trying if, if you can sort of get that. And the second one is, uh, since none of the numbers in the sequence are zero, um, every other number in, in that FP plus has an inverse, right? So we can multiply by that inverse and get uh, this equivalent formula, which, which turns out to be more useful. And the reason why this is more useful is um, because it lets you build the sequence starting with only two values, right? Uh, if, I have, if, some, if somebody comes and gives me A1 and A2, I can use this formula to get A3 and then use A2 and A3 to get A4 and so on, right? Which you probably, yeah, like you, you can do it if you use the, the original condition. Uh, it's just a little more uh, cumbersome in that the term that you, the, the, like the next term you want to get is, is uh, being multiplied by one term that you already have, right? Um, and so I'll just, uh, I'll just go over this example real quick. In, in the case that P is 11, um, somebody comes and gives me the number two and number eight, right? Um, and so A3 is gonna be the inverse of two, and that inverse is six because six times two is 12, which is congruent to one modulo 11. Um, and eight plus one is just nine. And six plus nine is again, 54, which leaves a residue of 10 modulo, uh, modulo 11. Uh, but think about A4 now. And, and so using this, this new formula, A4 will be uh, the inverse of A2 times A3 plus one, right? Um, but the inverse of A2 does, like, it's not gonna matter because A3 plus one is 10 plus one, and, and, and so 11, and, and 11, as we said earlier, is zero, right? 11 leaves a residue of zero, and so <laughs> we're multiplying zero times whatever number, we're gonna get a zero, right? Uh, so, if somebody comes and gives us these numbers and we try to build a sequence, A4 turns out to be zero. And that cannot happen, right? That, that's kind of a, a sort of a, the problem that, that, that arises when, when you start playing with some of these numbers to see how, how, to, how to deal with it. Um, but, but it's not like, it's not like all hope is lost. Uh, this, we know, so we, we now know that we can build a sequence uniquely based on the first two coefficients. And so this becomes into a sort of combinatorial problem, right? Because now um, you already know, you know how many pairs of first two numbers you can have. And it's exactly P minus one squared, right? Each number have, can be uh, any integer between one and P minus one. Um, but as the example showed, uh, none of these, not, not, not all of these pairs are gonna produce a valid sequence. And so uh, this is where another sort of very powerful idea is in my opinion, combinatorics uh, comes out. And, and that is when you, when you can't count something, uh, count its opposite, right? 
So we maybe we can't maybe we maybe counting the sequences that do not work is uh, here, right? And and the reason why it's easier is because you know what makes a, a pair of numbers not work, right? And that's having a zero eventually, right? Um, so that's going to be a strategy. We're going to count how many sequences or how many pairs of numbers do not produce a valid sequence um, by generating a zero eventually. Um, and again, because this sequence is uniquely determined, all of the others should produce uh, valid, valid sequences, right? And then we're just going to subtract uh, those sequences that do not work and, 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 and try to see what happens from there. Um, so yeah, the, the question now is, well, when does this become zero? And, and, and more importantly, if it eventually has a zero, uh, then there must, there must have been a first zero, right? Uh, and this is important because we're, we're going to look at it and, and trying to see what, what made it, what happened in the sequence so that this first zero appeared, right? Um, so let's just, call that first zero in the sequence a sub k plus two. Uh, and we we don't care right now what k is. Uh, we, we'll, we'll sort of try to uh, deal with it later. Um, uh, I think the slides got a little messed up here, but I'll, I'll try to just walk through the, the process. And essentially uh, the strategy is using, you know, using this formula that this, uh, this recurrence that we, that we obtain. Um, try to build the sequence backwards, right? Uh, so first of all, we know that a sub k plus two, which is equal to the inverse of a k plus, times one plus a k plus one is zero, right? Uh, but because a k is not zero, then its inverse is also not zero, right? So using this property that we that uh, a zero product means something has to be zero, then we have that the other number, a sub k plus one has to be, Right, and from there we were using again this notation trick and, and say, oh, a sub k plus one has to be negative one, right? Um, and let's do it again. If if we continue, if we keep doing uh, if we keep doing this and see and see if we can get something else, and and we can. Uh, so again, kind of using this recurrence formula, um, the strategy here is a bit different. Uh, but now what we what we do is, you know, you have the inverse of a sub k minus one. Um, but it's much more useful if you if you actually have the a sub k minus one because it, it is that that's the term of your sequence right that's the one that you're interested in getting information about and so we multiply by that uh, the inverse on the right is going to cancel and on the left we're going to get negative one and so that's going to leave us with with this equality right uh, but what's going to be more more useful is we sort of switch the position of a k and a k and a k minus one. Um, because if we do it again, and we try to uh, try to build one term back, uh, this one plus a sub k minus one becomes a negative a k, right? Um, and this is pretty cool because we are in a prime in this prime congruence in this prime field, um, and so we can divide, right? Uh, and if we can, we divide, uh, that lead, that tells us that, and I skipped a couple steps here, but a sub k minus two, uh, its inverse is going to be negative one. Um, uh, but negative one, you know, since negative one squared is one, then it's its own inverse, right? So a sub k minus two is negative one, right? Uh, and the thing is, this already happened, right? We know what happens when, when we have a negative one, and that is sort of the, the next term, um, is zero, right? And in fact, we have it here. A sub k minus one is going to be uh, the product of something times uh, negative one plus one, which is going to be zero, right? Um, and so the, the reasoning here should be, I was looking at the first zero that occurs in the sequence, right? And here I'm getting some, like one that appeared earlier. Uh, is this a contradiction or or, uh, or or what is happening here? And 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 the and the sort of the problem with the, with the reasoning here was that um, 
we didn't say anything about K, right? Uh, and, and, and what this shows is, is, is just that if K is too big, then the first zero cannot occur in like in that. So the first zero has to occur early in the sequence, right? Because if we can go backwards enough, we're gonna find another, right? And how backwards, that, that's, uh, that, 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 that would be uh, four. If you can go four, four, four terms backwards, uh, then your first zero, do you have a question? Yeah, so this reasoning started with a sub k plus two, right? Um, if k is, is big, we can go, uh, we can keep using this formula to go backwards in, in the terms. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. So, uh, uh, if k is 11, a sub 13 is the first zero, but the, uh, the k minus one, that's going to be a sub 10. It's also a zero. Right. So it's not really the first zero. So, and so the problem, is yes. So the problem, the problem that, that you have is uh, if, if you can go, uh, so if, uh, what was my way to say this? If, The only way that, they, that this sort of kind of this reasoning falls down or that this contradiction doesn't happen is that eventually you reach uh, A1 and you can go even more backwards, right? And so that, that's where we get this uh, limiting, um, yeah. That's where we get uh, this, 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 this sort of, uh, that's the consequence of this, right? If, if you do not have a zero in one of the first four terms then you're not gonna have a zero ever. Uh, but that's not gonna be, I mean, it's useful, but we 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 rather use this other condition. Um, we saw that before a zero, there had to be a negative one, right? Um, and so a sequence is not going to work if and only if there is a negative one in one of the first three terms. Um, this I, I I think this is better because you know you have to check less cases. Um, And, and and moreover, though, uh, the first two terms, remember that it's sort of, we, we sort of pick them, right? We're, we're analyzing a pair of numbers, so we, we get to pick them. And so the only interesting case is what happens when the third one is P minus one, right? Uh, but this happened twice already, and the first time was in the last slide. But the first time um, was in the example that I showed uh, with P equals 11 and two and eight, right? And that is when your first two terms add up to P minus one, uh, then the third term is going to be p minus one, right? And we saw if, if I go back to the uh, here, so two plus eight is going to be ten, and a three plus ten, right? Um, and good news, uh, yeah. Uh, now that we that we have this condition, we we're able to count exactly how many sort of non-valid pairs of numbers we're going to have. Um, and it's just a matter of looking at each case, right? When does it, when do we have a P minus one on the first number? When do we have a P minus one on the second and so on? Uh, and so for the, when you have a P minus one on the first number, the second number has P minus one possibilities, right? Um, a similar thing happens when the P minus one is in the second term, A2. Um, and you just have to make sure to get rid of the case in which both the first numbers were P minus one because you're counting it twice. Right, and then uh, the case in which the third one equals p minus one is, uh, you know, you have all these pairs like one plus p minus two, two plus p minus three, and so on, all the way up to p minus two and one. Um, and there's no sort of double counting here because um, if, if p minus one plus something is p minus one, then the other one has to be zero, right? But that uh, uh, that's not true. Um, and so if you, and so we're done, right? Uh, we got the number of invalid sequences. Um, and then we just sort of take that number out from the, the total number of pairs. And that, that should give us uh, F of P, right? Um, and if you, and after that, it's just a matter of saying, of checking like all the cases for P, right? P can, P is greater than five, so it cannot be five in particular. 
And so it has to leave a residue of either one, two, three, or four. And if you check each of those cases, I think I think it should be uh, it should be straightforward from there. If p is two or three, this expression is going to be zero. And if it's one or four, it should be two. Right. Um, and so yeah, that that was a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this idea of using the, the field is, it was sort of a just, yes, uh, a little bit more notation, but it made it easier when we're dealing with these equalities, right? We didn't have to write all these modulus and, and trying to keep track of, of stuff. Um, I think it, make, it makes for a cleaner solution. It just kind of goes to show that how to apply all these abstractions into problems, right? Um, so yeah. Um, and then the next problem that I wanted to talk a little bit about was A4, about this <laughs> probability problem, which Dr. Chang also already introduced. You have um, sort of random variables between zero and one, uh, which are uniformly distributed. And, and then you're gonna look at the first, uh, the first time that sort of, so it's like your, your sequence of numbers you can think of it as it starts falling down and you look at the first kind of value, right? When the next number uh, is actually greater. Uh, that can occur at the beginning, like at the very first term or second term, or it says that even if maybe there's no integer, right? When you have a completely, uh, a non-increasing sequence. Uh, and we want to find the expected value of S, right? This sort of the average of S. Um, so, I was not able to get this problem during the exam, but uh, after discussion with Dr. Chang, I, I kind of got some interesting ideas, um, and which I try to, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about them, right? Um, so this is sort of the what we're talking about. Um, we 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 can you know we can sort of get each case for k and get the expected value of our sum in each case, and then just multiply it for the probability that k equals one or k equals two and so on, right? Um, and an important detail here is that uh, this infinite sum is uh, sort of under the assumption that the that k is finite, right? We also need to take into account the case where a is infinite, right? Um, and this may seem easier because again, it's like maybe maybe we can come up with a formula for each K and, and then try to add up all that. Um, but it now divides us into two problems, right? How do we get uh, P of uh, the probability that K equals I and then the expected value of the sum. Um, and to do that, um, I, want, I, want, I want you to think, uh, and, and, and let's think first about uh, when K equals one, right? So when K equals one, the conditions of the problem, you're going to know that, or you're going to have that x1 is less than x2, right? Um, and it's sort of an even only if. If that happens, then k is necessarily 1, right? Because there are no previous terms. Uh, and because the rest of the variables are distributed uh, uniformly and independently, um, we kind of ignore the rest of the variables and only focus on the on the distribution of, of x1 and x2, right? So we can project, so if you, if you think of a hypercube of side one in, in the in dimensional space, uh, and you project it onto only x1 and x2, and the x1 and x2 axis, uh, and you want to see in, in which cases that, that uh, you have x1 with an x2, right? Um, and that's, that's a sort of a, Rather a common problem in probability. Um, if you if you sort of graph those in a plane and, and, and assign the point to each possible choice, uh, the the choices that are going to work are the ones in the blue triangle, right? Uh, where the sort of the x the y coordinate is, or x two coordinate is greater than the x one coordinate, um, and Again, because everything is uniformly distributed, then this distribution is also uh, uniform, right? Each point is equally likely to be chosen. And so the probability that k equals one is just the area of that blue triangle, 
which is one half, right? Um, but uh, but instead of thinking about it, so or in addition to that, let, let's try to think about this in a more algebraic or calculus-based way. Um, the way in which in, in which we get this area is by means of a double integral, right? Um, and and here we go. Um, and and we're integrating this constant function again because everything is uniformly distributed. Um, but the integral looks something like that, right? X one. So and and we sort of understand it from from the outside to the inside. You know, x two can be free from zero one. The only condition is that x1 is between 0 and x2, right? Um, unfortunately for us, we only have three dimensions. So sort of visualizing the rest of the cases is a bit hard. Um, even for the when k equals 2, in which you kind of only you, you end up only caring about the first three, three numbers. Vietnamese stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Okay. Oh. oh. Yeah. It's fine. Um, so, um, should I mute them? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, Before before going on, well, let, let's let's try to think about this uh, k equals two case, right? Um, we we would like we want um, x one to be greater than x two, greater than or equal, and x two to be less than x three, right? And those things have to happen at the same time. Uh, we have only one or none, then k is not going to be k is not going to be uh, that number. K is not going to be two. Sorry. Um, and so the the volume that or the the subset of space that satisfy those those constraints is and if you look at sort of um, I like to think of it as so if you if you look at the projection each each of the two conditions that we have is uh, can be evaluated separately right in which cases does uh, x one is greater than x two and that's going to be this triangle over here. In the horizontal plane, and for which cases x two is uh, less than x three, and that's going to be this kind of in the side face of the cube, this triangle, right? Um, and the the set of points in space that are going to satisfy that are going to make k equal two is going to be sort of you, you kind of extrude those two triangles and get the intersection of those extrusions, right? Which is not easy to visualize. Um, but um, but 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 again, and, and that's why I was insisting earlier on, on trying to let's try, trying to think about this in a more calculus-based way. Uh, we have again just a just a, an integral, right, with multiple variables. Um, and in general, uh, you know, in the general case, we're going to know that we can we can apply a similar strategy to what we did uh, for the case with uh, just with k equals one, right. And we're gonna have sort of this, this expression for the probability that k equals a given value, right? Um, and again, kind of going from the outside to the inside, like uh, x sub k plus one can be any one, any, any value between zero and one. And then the other one, the other variables are constrained by this, by this set of inequalities, right? Um, and so, Let's try to let's try to, I'm, and I'm I'm gonna be gonna go a little quicker over this. Uh, in general, in any in any in any one of in any of these sort of higher order integrals, there is something in common, right? And that is sort of in in the middle or the in the innermost intervals. I'll I'll have the this detail in common that their limits are a number and one, right? Um, we can worry about the last two later, but but if we if we sort of uh, focus only on the on the inner innermost ones, um, we can we can talk about this this sequence of integrals in a recursive manner, right? Um, and and I, this is this is where I write them. Um, 
f sub k plus one of, and this could be x, but I, I chose it just so I put x sub k plus one for clarity. Uh, you define as the integral, you know, uh, with limits x sub k plus one and one of the previous function, right? Um, and the goal is to try to get a, an alternative or more closed form expression of this integral so that we can then perform the last two intervals in a more easy way, right? Um, uh, so I, I was not able to prove this when I was trying, uh, when I was trying this problem uh, a couple of weeks ago in preparing this presentation, but um, this seems to happen at least for the first cases, right? If you, if instead of integrating from X to one, you integrate from zero to one, the value that you get is one over K factorial, right? Um, and this turns out to be very useful because um, if we look at those two last integrals, we may not have a closed expression for FK, but the sort of the, this inner integral, we can express it as the integral from zero to one minus the integral from X to one, right? In this sort of complement, complement again, this idea of count the opposite kind of peaks out again. Um, and we know how to get those integrals, right? The, the left, the left one is one over k factorial of our conjecture, uh, and the rightmost one would be uh, next function, uh, and then and we do it again, and and it ends up being this value, right? So. Uh, and I'm just going to go quickly over the official solution. Unfortunately, uh, this seems like a rather tedious approach in that you have to, that was only one part, right? We needed to compute the expected value of the sum and um, the penum does it, well, it's like six problems for three hours. So that may suggest that there may, may be an, a, power, a more powerful idea. And that is, um, yeah, there is, it's like you take a, a sum, an infinite sum, right? Where the term is zero if you kind of already went past your K. Um, and this is a theorem uh, that they use in an official solution is um, it is not zero if and only if sort of all the other variables before that one occur in decreasing order and are contained in this interval, right? And so um, we get that and, and those two conditions are independent and, and the probabilities are, so this is a probability that the other I minus one occur in non-decreasing order, uh, only one of those possible orderings is gonna be non-decreasing. And the other one is that uh, this is the probability that all of them are in that interval, right? So evaluating that gives us this value, which after a little bit manipulation, it becomes a Taylor series for e to the one half. And that's... So that was it, um, but it was a, I really like this idea of integrals and I hope to maybe see if I can finish that solution, but in the meantime.